Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, wow. out. I it was that fall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from John DeManja. It was recorded in March 2015 at the New American Shakespeare Tavern in Atlanta, Georgia, as part of the Atlanta Science Festival. Okay, so it was the spring semester of 1989 at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. If you're wondering where Carbondale, Illinois is, it's in the southern part of Illinois, in what they call the heartland. It's further away than Chicago than uh, St. Louis is, just a couple hours from Chicago. And it was my first semester in graduate school. Uh, my first semester as a teaching assistant in graduate school, and I was really looking forward to it because my dad is a history professor, one of those long-winded history professors, you know the kind. And my mom is a trained psychologist, and uh, she was a high school principal. And so around the dinner table, we were very much used to, um, you know, strategies of teaching, difficult uh, students and the like. And so I grew up listening to all that stuff. And this was finally my, my first chance at experiencing what they had firsthand, you know, first, first day of class. I was really looking forward to it. And so, I ent as I entered the laboratory class and was walking towards the, um, the, the, the front of the class, I heard some snickering, which was a little troubling. And then when I got to the front of the class and I turned around and looked at the back, I saw people sort of elbowing each other and pointing at me and snickering some more. And so my first thought was, is my fly open? You know, is there a big kick me sign on the back that the other graduate students put on me and whatnot? But I knew that wasn't the case because I had gone to the bathroom before and I had checked myself, you know, just to make sure. <laughs> you know, no, no pranks on me. But then very quickly, a, a more disturbing thought came to my mind and I was like, oh my God. Might they be uh, looking at the color of my skin instead of the content of my character? And so that was a little bit more disturbing to take, but I had to consider that. And it was even a little more disturbing because I wasn't expecting it in that setting, right? I mean, if I step outside and try to hail a cab and the taxis go by, I, I'm used to that. If I go to a department store and, you know, I see that clerk following me aisle by aisle, I can handle that, right? If I get on an elevator and I see a little perch clutching, I can rationalize that, right? If I go to a restaurant and everybody's served 10 minutes before I am, even though we got in all at the same time, well, that's a little harder to handle. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can still rationalize that in some way. But this was not a setting where I had expected it. Coming from the background that I came from and hearing all these you know, stories from my parents and whatnot, 
I wasn't prepared for that. So a number of emotions went through my mind, you know, anger, frustration. But then something also went through my mind. <clears throat> you know those things that parents tell you when you're growing up and you kind of roll your, your, your eyes, you know? I mean, the, 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 the pearls of wisdom, you know? And so my mom had something that she always told me. She's like, there's what, hap there's what happens to you and there's how you handle it. And so in that moment, I decided that this situation was a little different than the others that I was just talking about. Most times, when you're you know, on the receiving end of prejudice, you're in a position of weakness where you can't do anything about it. But this situation was a little different. I was the teacher of the class. So I was in charge. So I had to do something about it. So my first thought was, the best thing to take charge of a class is pop quiz. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take control of this class, all right. <laughs> so what I did, remember this is 1989, so chalk, blackboard, right? So I had time to think about the questions I was going to ask. So the first two questions were, you know, one was a stoichiometry problem and another one was a math problem. <laughs> Arithmetic, you know, you want to check, spot check what you know, the levels uh, your students are at. But the third one was a little oddball that I threw in there. So the third question was, what is your favorite song? And what I decided is, music is the interna an international language that we all speak. So I decided that that was going to be a way that I was going to try to reach out, my first reach out to the students. And so the students uh, you know, completed their assignments and I went over the syllabus and I could already see that some, from the smiles of some of the students that they appreciated the icebreaker effort, right? So that was good. And we went through the syllabus and the normal things that you do on the first day of class. And, uh, but you understand that I was relieved when class was over. And throughout the rest of the day, I was dis distra trying to distract myself with you know, talking to the other graduate students, looking on working in the lab and whatnot. But when I got home, of course, the flood of emotions came back because I was alone. And I tried to look at the pros and cons of the situation. And, well, we want to talk about the cons first. So uh, the, the, the major problem that I had was I couldn't talk to anybody about it. Who was I going to talk to? My advisors? My fellow students? I was the only one that looked like me in the department. So who could, I, who could relate to what I had just gone through? Right? But on the plus side was the fact that I knew that the subject matter, chemistry, was not going to be the problem. I had a passion of chemistry and I had done enough at that time already that I knew that that wasn't going to be the problem. And as the son of two teachers, I was going to do my level best to teach it in a way that was going to be entertaining and meaningful and whatnot. So I could put that aside because I knew that that wasn't going to be an issue. The other thing that I decided was that I was going to forge an individual relationship with all the, all the students in the class. Now, if I was teaching a class of 150, that would be a, a, a big, little bit more of a problem because of the class size. But this was a lab class, so it was 28 students. So I decided to reach out. And then another plus was that I had a week in between classes, so I had a lot of time to recover if I needed to, right? So what I did at the, the next week for class is I got there and I gave a pop quiz <laughs> right away. But I showed up also with a boom box, uh, which as I entered the classroom kind of raised a few eyebrows in the classroom and whatnot. So after I went through the um, assignment of the day, as is typically done in those classes, you know, safety concerns and whatnot. We started the lab, and I went to the corner of the lab, put a cassette tape in the boom box, and, st and it started playing. And the music, the first song, was the anthem from Journey, Don't Stop Believing. And this was the 80s, so this was a song that was very popular. And the students looked up at me and were surprised that that was the first song. And I said, remember your answer to the third question? 
well, I'm such a music buff that I have all these songs at home, and I made a tape of all your favorite songs. And that's going to be the soundtrack to what, to, to what we work with today. And so that got a few smiles in the class. They liked that. And so as we kept working and the, 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 you know, the hours went along in the lab, somebody finally asked me, well, what's your favorite song? And I said, Let It Be by the Beatles. And that surprised them too. But for me, it was normal. I was a big Beatles buff, you know, growing up in the 60s and whatnot. So, but it was still interesting to see the look of surprise on them. But anyways, from that point, that was the beginning of individual conversations, right? Because for every piece of music, I had all the trivia, you know? I was big on trivia and history, right? My dad, history professor, you know? And so we started conversations that started with music, but then it went into sports and recipes and, you know, cooking recipes and whatnot. And so by the sixth week, if you entered the class, you could see 30, you know, 28 be goggled students milling about, doing their experiments, music playing in the back, and uh, an all around, you know, normal class atmosphere. My office hours were well attended. I was fairly popular with the students. And, uh, but back in the back of my mind, there was still this lingering thought of what had happened that first day of class. So one day, Rachel, one of the students, came in during the office hours. And uh, I felt close enough to her that I said, you know, can we talk about what happened that first day? And she said, sure, sure, sure. We've talked about it amongst cl our, our classmates and whatnot. And so the reason why we reacted to you this way is because we just didn't know what to expect from you. Many graduate st uh, schools in the country have a number of Indian students that are you know, on, on, on staff as graduate students. And when we see Indian students, they speak English a little different than we do, but we know they're good. Right? There are a lot of Asian students in these graduate schools, and we don't hear as well, you know, we, don't, we don't, uh, can't, can't follow them as well, but we know they're good. But you, we just didn't know. But now we do. And so what really I took out of that was the candor of her comments, that she felt close enough that she was willing to tell me what they actually really thought. And that warmed my heart. The day of the last class, Sean, another student, said, I want to take a class picture. And I said, sure, you know, normal thing to do, class pictures at the end of a semester. And so we stepped out of Necker's Hall and went to the close amphithe amphitheater that's, that's close to the, the building. And I couldn't help but smile because as the folks were getting ready to take pictures, you could see several students jockeying position to be close to me. And in my mind, I couldn't help but juxtapose that snapshot in time with the snapshot from the first day. And that was really a nice feeling of how far we had come and what we had accomplished together. And so Sean eventually gave me a picture of the, um, of the class, uh, the class picture, which I kept on my desk for every semester I was there at Southern Illinois. And before the first day of every class, I would look at it for inspiration. And I needed it because the first day of class never changed. Except that now I was ready for it. And I had a plan before entering class. And as I told you, this will happen in 1989. A lot of years have passed since then. And I have done conferences all over the world, China, Brazil, South Africa. And I'm used to the feeling of going in knowing that if you're good enough, you don't have to worry about it. The rest will take care of itself. And so I don't need that picture anymore. Thank you. That was John DeMonja. John is an associate professor of chemistry at Spelman College. A native of Oxford, Ohio, John grew up in the U.S., Belgium, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. His professional career includes work as an analytical chemist at the NASA Ames Research Center and the CDC prior to joining Spelman in 2002. An internationally recognized leader in the field of multidimensional gas chromatography, John has given over 250 lectures around the world in the past 20 years. He enjoys cooking and traveling with his wife Anne, playing the piano, and golfing now that his basketball days are over. 
The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, and Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the New American Shakespeare Tavern for hosting the show, to the Atlanta Science Festival for being amazing partners, and to Shakespeare for having a tavern in America. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.